Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start, at the very least, on my review of Breakfast of Champions by Kurt Vonnegut. So this is one of his classic novels. Uh, spoiler alert, this is probably the one I've enjoyed the most out of all of his. But as usual, I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out my tabs, and I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Dane reads... In a frolic of cartoon and comic outbursts against rule and reason, a miraculous weaving of science fiction, memoir, parable, fairy tale and farce, Kurt Vonnegut attacks the whole spectrum of American society, releasing some of his best loved literary creations on the scene. So, um, there are a lot of drawings in this and actually uh, they're all done by Vonnegut but you almost couldn't present the book without the drawings because the manuscript refers directly to them. So we'll have uh, for example this. I am programmed at 50 to perform childishly, to insult the Star Spangled Banner, to scroll pictures of a Nazi flag and an asshole and a lot of other things with a felt tip pen. To give an idea of the maturity of my illustrations for this book, here is my picture of an asshole. And we learn about a Roman Emperor called uh, Heliogabulus. This was the name of a Roman emperor who had a sculptor make a hollow, life-sized iron bull with a door on it. The door could be locked from the outside. The bull's mouth was open. That was the only other opening to the outside. Heliogabulus would have a human being put into the bull through the door, and the door would be locked. Any sounds a human being made in there would come out of the mouth of the bull. Heliogabulus would have guests in for a nice party with plenty of food and wine and beautiful women and pretty boys. And Heliogabulus would have a servant-like kindling. The kindling was under dry firewood, which was under the bull. And yeah, it's pretty grim. And uh, yeah, then what would happen is like steam would come out. It would look as though the bull was issuing forth steam. And obviously the person would die. Uh, we get a reference to uh, overpopulation, a very real concern, especially now. And Kilgore Trout is here, that's, a re that's what the reference on the uh, rear cover was to uh, some, of, some of Vonnegut's most well-loved creations. So at the start of chapter 7 we have, Kilgore Trout took a leak in the men's room of the New York City movie house. There was a sign on the wall next to the roller towel. It advertised a massage parlour called the Sultan's Harem. Massage parlours were something new and exciting in New York. Men could go in there and photograph naked women, or they could paint the women's naked bodies with water-soluble paints. Men could be rubbed all over by a woman until their penises squirted jism into Turkish towels. It's a full life and a merry one, said Kilgore Trout. There was a message written in pencil on the tiles by the roller towel. This was it. And it says, what is the purpose of life? And I'm going to show that to you now. It looks a little bit like that. And I want to read this little bit out from chapter 8. Trout wandered out onto the sidewalk of 42nd Street. It was a dangerous place to be. The whole city was dangerous because of chemicals and the uneven distribution of wealth and so on. A lot of people were like Dwayne. They created chemicals in their own bodies which were bad for their heads. But there were thousands upon thousands of other people in the city who bought bad chemicals and ate them or sniffed them or injected them into their veins with devices which looked like this. Sometimes they even stuffed bad chemicals up their assholes. Their assholes looked like this. So we have a picture of a syringe and there's his illustration of an asshole again. And here we get a pretty interesting reference to one of Kilgore Trout's short stories. Um, I mean, Vonnegut was a really good ideas man, so his short stories for his character actually sound really interesting. I kind of wish he'd written some of these. Kilgore Trout once wrote a story called This Means You. It was set in the Hawaiian Islands, the place where the lucky winners of Dwayne Hoover's contest in Midland City were supposed to go. Every bit of land on the islands was owned by only about 40 people, and in the story, Trout had those people decide to exercise their property rights to the full. They put up no trespassing signs on everything. This created terrible problems for the million other people on the islands. The law of gravity required that they stick somewhere on the surface. Either that, or they could go out into the water and bob offshore. But then the federal government came through with an emergency program. It gave a big balloon full of helium to every man, woman and child who didn't own property. Which does sound like something the federal government would do. We get, uh, the manager reminded Trout of what the first man to set foot on the moon had said. One small step for man, one great leap for, giant, uh, for mankind. But actually they said one giant leap, not one great leap. But also he meant to say one small step for a man. Because otherwise the quote doesn't actually make any sense. I like this little bit here. Like most science fiction writers, Trout knew almost nothing about science, was bored stiff by technical details. But no cry from a whistle had got very far from Earth for this reason. Sound could only travel in an atmosphere, and the atmosphere of Earth relative to the planet wasn't even as thick as the skin of an apple. Beyond that lay an all but perfect vacuum. An apple was a popular fruit which looked like this. There's a dinosaur for you as well. And we get a reference to the beetle car. People called it the beetle. A real beetle looked like this. 
The mechanical beetle was made by Germans. The real beetle was made by the creator of the universe. Dwayne gets reminded of a ditty his father would sing sometimes when he was drunk. Roses are red and ready for plucking. You're 16 and ready for high school. And there's a, it says the most expensive thing a person can do is get sick, which is certainly true in America. We get a few, we get a few uh, N-bombs and a reference to black people liking fried chicken. And uh, we get a few times a reference to wide open beavers, which are just, you know, women with their legs open, basically. Harry's wife, Grace, was stretched out on a chaise long at some distance from the bed. She was smoking a small cigar in a long holder made from the leg bone of a stork. A stork was a large European bird, about half the size of a Bermuda urn. Children who wanted to know where babies came from were sometimes told that they were brought by storks. People who told their children such a thing felt that their children were too young to think intelligently about wide open beavers and all that. We get a reference to the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, who I believe uh, is who the Beatles went to visit in India. And I just thought this was funny. Um, it's, it's probably true in some places. Wayne Hubler smiled now, not because he was happy, but because with so little to do, he thought he might as well show off his teeth. They were excellent teeth. The adult correctional institution at Shepherdstown was proud of its dentistry program. It was such a famous dental program, in fact, that it had been written up in medical journals and in the Reader's Digest, which was the Dying Planet's most popular magazine. The theory behind the program was that many ex-convicts could not or would not get jobs because of their appearances, and good looks began with good teeth. The program was so famous, in fact, that police even in neighbouring states, when they picked up a poor man with expensively made teeth, fillings and bridge work and all that, were likely to ask him, alright boy, how many years you spend in Shepherdstown? And we get a reference to pi, which uh, I will test myself here. It is 3.141592653589739323846264338327950288841, as everybody knows. Uh, and now I drew a symbol whose meaning Dwayne had known for a few years in school, a meaning which had since eluded him. The, per the symbol would have looked like the end of a table in a prison dining hall to Wayne. It represented the ratio of the circumference of a circle to its diameter. The ratio could also be expressed as a number, and even as Dwayne and Wayne and Karabekian and Beatrice Kiesler and all the rest of us went about our business, Earthling scientists were monotonously radioing that number into outer space. The idea was to show other inhabited planets, in case they were listening, how intelligent we were. We had tortured circles until they coughed up this symbol of their secret lives. Very cool. And um, we get a reference to alcohol, which is a newly, well, not that new, but a teetotal. Te I am a teetotal. And um, we get, like everybody else in the cocktail lounge, he was softening his brain with alcohol. This was a substance produced by a tiny creature called yeast. Yeast organisms ate sugar and excreted alcohol. They killed themselves by destroying their own environment with yeast shit. Kilgore Trout once wrote a short story which was a dialogue between two pieces of yeast. They were discussing the possible purposes of life as they ate sugar and suffocated in their own excrement. Because of their limited intelligence, they never came close to guessing that they were making champagne. We get this little line which I think is possibly more relevant now than ever. This was the reasons Americans shot each other so often. It was a convenient literary device for ending short stories and books. And we get this which is very dark. Leroy Joyce was so dumb, Bonnie went on. He couldn't play cards. He couldn't understand the Bible. He could hardly talk. He ate his last supper and then he sat still. He was going to be electrocuted for rape. So my husband sat out in the corridor outside the cell and he read to himself. He heard Leroy moving around in his cell, but he didn't worry about it. And then Leroy rattled his tin cup on the bars. My husband thought Leroy wanted some more coffee. So he got up and went over and took the cup. Leroy was smiling as though everything was all right now. He wouldn't have to go to the electric chair after all. He'd cut off his watch him call it and put it in the cup. And as we get towards the end here, this is where um, Vodega himself becomes a character in the book. And uh, we get a reference to this plastic stuff. This is probably pretty realistic. I don't know if we do have this kind of shit, but... The substance was coming from the Barrytron plant. The company was manufacturing a new anti-personnel bomb for the Air Force. The bomb scattered plastic pellets instead of steel pellets because the plastic pellets were cheaper. They were also impossible to locate in the bodies of wounded enemies by means of x-ray machines. And I like this. Again, breaks the fourth wall, but it works well here. Uh, Vonnegut is definitely an example of you know those authors who knew the rules before they broke them. His situation, insofar as he was a machine, was complex, tragic, and laughable. But the sacred part of him, his awareness, remained an unwavering band of light. And this book is being written by a meat machine in cooperation with a machine made of metal and plastic. The plastic, incidentally, is a close relative of the gunk in Sugar Creek. And at the core of the writing meat machine is something sacred, which is an unwavering band of light. At the core of each person who reads this book is a band of unwavering light. And we get a reference to This Is Your Life, which is presented as an, a television show which had been popular a few years back that wasn't on the air anymore. I know of it. I don't think I've ever seen it. Uh, we get a guy uh, lying on his back uh, trying to learn French by means of listening to lessons recorded on tape. Demain nous allons passer la soirée au cinéma, said the tape, and Don tried to say it too. 
Nous espérons que notre grand-père vivra encore longtemps. As that means, uh, tomorrow we are going to spend the evening at the cinema. We hope that our grandfather lives for, for a long time more. And an incredibly racist thing that I imagine this did used to happen. Yeah. This does sound very society. We are a society. We live in a society. Uh, Dwayne laughed. African Dodger, he said. This had reference to a sort of carnival booth which was popular when Dwayne was a boy. A black man would stick his head through a hole in a piece of canvas at the back of a booth and people would pay money for the privilege of throwing hard baseballs at his head. If they hit his head, they won a prize. And I just, this line I quite liked. I uh, retracted my testicles into my abdominal cavity, pulled them into my fuselage like the landing gear of an airplane, and now they tell me that only surgery will bring them down again. So yeah, as you can see from Breakfast of Champions, there was a lot of stuff I liked. I really enjoyed the illustrations to it, actually. I just thought it was really well written. It holds up a mirror to uh, society, particularly at the time that Vonnegut was writing it, but we can kind of compare that to where we are now and see how much progress we have made. Spoiler alert, not very much. I liked uh, the break in the fourth wall, the fact that he had himself as a character in it. Um, doesn't always work but I felt like it worked well here and overall just a cracking read um, contender for one of my top books of the year I gave it a strong 4.5 out of 5 so there you have it that's what I made of Breakfast of Champions by Kurt Vonnegut as always don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you read it hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video hit that subscribe button for more and I'll see you soon for another bookish video thanks a lot bye bye